Well, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, and welcome, and thank you for joining us as we take a look today at the five key principles behind the Andrews Median Lines. Uh, Tim Morge is going to be going over how this is a true leading indicator and trend trading tool. Now, so with that, though, before we get into Tim's presentation, I'm very happy to have Barbara Schmidt-Bailey join us from the CMA. Barbara, I'm going to go ahead and put these on your slides uh, so that we can review some of the information about the products that are going to be discussed today. By the way, we're very happy to have CME sponsor all of all of the Tim Moore events. So uh, with that, Barbara, let me actually pass you the ball and let's get started. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. We are always really, really pleased to be co-sponsoring Interactive Brokers events. Consider them a, an important and valued partner, and uh, Cynthia has certainly put a lot, a lot of time and effort into these presentations, and I, I know you will enjoy this one as you have other Interactive Brokers webinars. So my name is Barbara Schmidt-Bailey with CME Group, and I'm also pleased to be welcoming you to this presentation, The Key Five Principles Behind the Andrews Median Line, a True Leading Indicator and Trend Trading Tool with Tim Morch. As a trader and investor, you look for opportunity in the markets and a way to capture that opportunity. Futures and futures options are extremely flexible tools for expressing your market opinion and capturing trading opportunity. CME Group futures markets consist of contracts which trade on four separate exchanges, the CBOT, the CME, the NYMEX, and the COMEX exchanges, and span the major asset classes from Forex, Stock Index, Agricultural Commodities, energies, metals, and interest rates. Our markets trade electronically almost 24 hours a day, providing traders an opportunity to trade market volatility whenever they want, wherever they are. And CME Group is a part of a regulated industry under the U.S. CFTC and NFA, which safeguard the integrity of the futures markets. CME Group's NYMEX energy markets represent one of the most liquid in the world, with contracts covering WTI crude oil, heating oil, RBOB, gasoline, and natural gas, just to name several of the most liquid contracts. You can see from this volume chart uh, through the month of May that these are extremely liquid contracts with high, high volume on a daily basis. Um, in the month of May, the light sweet crude oil futures had over 560,000 contracts traded a day. Light sweet crude oil options over 160,000 contracts a day. Nat gas futures over or almost 394,000 contracts a day. Heating oil futures 125,000 a day. And the RBOB gas futures 148,000 contracts a day. Plenty of liquidity there um, to meet almost anyone's trading or hedging needs. For an in-depth introduction to the CME Group Energy Markets, please look on the Interactive Broker site for the archive recording from two weeks ago. My colleague Trevor Lindhut, a manager on our energy team, uh, spent over an hour talking about um, the key NYMEX products and contract specifications, the market participants in these markets, and the supply and demand forces that play a role in the price movements in these markets. In today's presentation, Tim will be focusing on CME Group's energy markets in his trading examples. Many of you already will be familiar with Tim and his work as a longtime trader and member of the exchange. Tim devotes much of his time now to teaching traders and running his educational website and service at marketgeometry.com. This presentation is part of a year-long series with Tim, which we refer to as the CME Group School of Futures. And as Tim presents his ideas and strategies for trading products, we move each month from one asset class to the next, from gold to oil to interest rates, equities, agriculture, and we encourage you to look for archived recordings of Tim's past presentations as well as watch for next month's upcoming event. So Tim, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Cynthia. It's always great to work with both of you. I hope you guys can all hear me. Uh, I mean, something Vlad says it's a big event in his life. Hey, it's a big event in my life. I take one day out of every month to try and give back uh, through the CME and IB. Um, I, I've done, I can't even count the number of webcasts we've done together, the three of us. And uh, 
we're just going to keep going into 2013 and uh, and see what we can do. Today, I'm going to talk about something that's really, really close to my heart. First thing I'm going to do is collapse my chat panel. So, um, do me a favor, just relax and save questions till we're finished. And uh, because this is so close to me, I'm going to not be distracted by chat. I'm just going to try and get through this because we, it's a tremendous amount of slides. Um, all right, here we go. So today, we're going to talk about uh, Dr. Andrews' meeting line tool. And um, I spent 15 years uh, on and off at Dr. And Dr. Andrews' house. My, my brother lived a couple miles away. Uh, he was my introduction to Dr. Andrews. And he was my first solid mentor uh, to trading. I had already begun to trade a little bit. Um, I was a very, very, well, I was a teenager, to be honest. And um, I was allowed to use my brother's account. So before we go any further, um, everybody has to give a little bit of a disclosure these days. Uh, it's been that way as long as I've been in the industry. And frankly, it's a good soul-searching tool. Um, you'll, you'll get to understand exactly what I'm about. You can go ahead and read this while I give my brief disclosure. It's very brief. Um, there is no holy grail. I'd give it to you if I had it, but I don't have it. The closest thing to holy, the holy grail is education, hard work, and taking responsibility for all facets of your trading. And that last bit, which means mastering yourself, is often the hardest part of the equation, and I urge you to please, please, take the time to find your strengths, find your weaknesses, work to overcome your weaknesses, and play to your strengths. Again, this webcast is dedicated to my earliest mentor, Dr. Alan Andrews. He was a Newtonian physicist that developed action reaction lines and median lines in the mid 1920s to 1940s at MIT in Massachusetts. Then he moved to Florida and was a professor in Florida, professor of physics. And um, m many of you may not, may not know this. Um, I was lucky enough to be around early. And I was part of his original inner circle, and there weren't that many of us to begin with, and there are only eight of us left now. I'm the only one left that trades or speaks publicly, although there are uh, three or four of us here besides myself, which is always, it's always a pleasure to see you, gentlemen. And uh, we get together every once in a while, but uh, there's only a few of us left carrying forward his work, so I'm always um, honored when I get the opportunity, and thank you to CME and uh, IB. Cynthia and Barbara for allowing me to continue this. So we're going to look at the median line, and you'll see that it's a wonderful tool that can detect the trend earlier than anything I know, and it'll also tell you when trends have ended. Um, and those are very difficult things to find in a tool, but if you relax and use it correctly, um, it does some wonderful things. Within it, yet it's still a very simple tool to learn if you just take your time. So. We're going to look at a 240-minute price swing chart from crude oil futures, and we're going to use two technical analysis tools. Now, generally, when I see people using median lines or teaching median lines, unfortunately, they miss the mark. They use them and teach them as if they were channels. And we'll go. What we're going to do is we're going to look at a simple price swing using channels, and then we'll use media lines to look at the same price swing. And you'll see the difference between the two and why people that try and use media lines as channels have taken what's important and good about the media line out of the work. And why, when it's used correctly, media lines are a much quicker set of lines that can capture the trend two or three pivots before you could draw a correct channel, for example, or before your squiggly indicator at the bottom of your chart turns. So let's, let's get started. This one's real simple. Here we go. Here's our first price swing. Here's our low. Here's our high. I actually didn't even forget the little bouncing ball there, Cynthia. Price comes up, and here we run out of energy. Price turns lower take out this prior low. We now have, and here's where we run out of energy, we now have three potential pivots. This low, this high, 
and this low. Price goes higher, takes out this high. So now we made a new high for this move. And if you think about it, these are expanding pivots because it took out this low, now it's taking out this high. Price comes back and retraces some of its accomplishments and runs out of energy to the downside. Price sprints higher, and you might expect that because when it turned lower, it didn't have much luck to the downside. It made a little bit of traction into this prior swing, but then it turned higher, and this higher, this, this swing higher expends a lot of energy. So you would expect that it will run out of energy. It's not going to go to the moon. Price turns lower. Look where it ends. You draw a straight line or a horizontal line across the prior high. Price comes back and retests this high. Runs out of energy, finds buyers. Sprints back higher. Price makes a marginal new high, but runs out of energy. And now price turns lower, takes out the prior swing low. Now, this is a new high, but it's barely a new high as far as I'm concerned. It's well, what most of you call it double tops. And so there were lots of sellers. We would call them whales. There are traders like myself that trade large amounts um, that were willing to sell up in here. To them, perhaps the trend was getting a little old. Maybe there was prior structure over in this area to the left, something made them want to sell over here, or there was a large hedger, for example. So now we're going to take a look using channels, and we're going to try and find the probable path of price. And to make it easy, I just gave you a look, excuse me, at the swings that we're going to use to draw a channel. So. Of course, you all know where price is going, but the poor guy that's drawing the channel and the meeting line coming up will have, won't have the slightest idea. So let's see what we can do with that. Sorry, price sprints higher, runs out of energy, turns back lower. Makes a slight new low, runs out of energy to the downside. Now, let's think about this. At this point, we finally have something that we can draw on if we're a channel trader. We have the minimum number of pivots that you need to draw a channel. One, two, three. For those of you that have ever drawn a channel or seen one drawn, of course it'll look like this. So if you've never done it or you've never seen one, we're going to connect the bottoms this low and this low. That'll give us a line with a downward slope. We're going to copy that line. We're going to swing it on top, unless you're drawn by paper, in which case you'll have to measure it using a rolling pr protractor. Bring it up here. We're going to draw the line with the same slope that's parallel to this line, off of this high. And that's our first channel. Now, if you're a channel trader and you believe in channels, this channel projects where price should run an energy, out of energy to the downside and where it should run out of energy to the upside. Let's add another swing and see how our channel performs. Price breaks out above the prior high and blows right through the top of the channel. Hmm. Busted after just one pivot. That did not work very well. So maybe the channel needs one more pivot to define the probable the probable path of price. Maybe now we can draw better. Let's take a look. Price begins to trade lower. Okay, I can draw that. So instead of using these lower pivots, I decide to connect these prior highs. And that'll give me a slope line. I'm going to copy the slope line, drag it over to the bottom, connect it to this prior low right here because it's lower than this low, project them both forward, 
Oh, this looks like a good channel to me. I think I got it. So maybe I fixed the channel. Let's hope it works now. Okay. You know, when price headed lower and ran out of energy, I just simply copied the slope of this line. I made it this fantastically artistic dotted fashion right here. And I just eyeballed it up, put it right about in the middle. And sure enough, look, why price right energy ran out of energy right in the middle. Hey, this channel is rocking now. I think I got it dead to rights. This is exactly what I was looking for. I'm sure it's working now. Uh, this channel's just not working well for me. You can't see me, but I got my head cradled in my hands. So I'm scratching my brow. Can you hear that? I take a look. You know, I didn't spend any time in art school. But I'm kind of tired of drawing new channels. Is there something I could do with this thing? Hey, what if I... You know how I added this channel in the middle? Yeah, I, I know the channel's broken. But what, what if I grab this one, measure the distance, put it right up on top? Let's see what that looks like. Hey, I think I got something here. You know what? Okay, maybe it busted this, but it, maybe it's maybe I caught the right frequency. I, you know what? I, I, I'm sure I have the right channel now. Let's see what we get. You know, look where it stopped. Uh, that's, that'll just make you mad. Stopped in the middle of nowhere. So I'm going to erase this mess and start all over again. So I'm going to connect this top and this top. Get a sloping line, flop it over the bottom, connect it to this low, project it forward. I'm even going to leave my center line in. I kind of like that's kind of neat. Yeah, I bet this one works. You know, if I actually take a look at it, well, these are kind of equal to these. Oh, you know what? This is starting starting to get very arty. I like this. This is working pretty good. I think this will probably contain everything. You know, we're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, seven or eight pivots into this darn thing, and I don't know. I guess this channel's working, kind of. I mean, it hasn't been busted now. So I think I got a crowd. Look at, I got this and this and this are all inside. Uh, I don't know. Let, let, let's see what that does for me. You know, this is just annoying. I'm now eight or nine swings into this thing, and none of the channels that I was able to draw worked worth, uh, you know what? It just, it just is not happening for me. You know, as as much as I try and curve fit these channels, if I'm trading, I just keep getting stopped out of these rascals. I, I don't. Know. Maybe this isn't for me. Okay, I surrender. Let me take a drink of tea. Now I'm going to use median lines. See what it does for me. Okay, here's my first swing. My low, my high. You've seen this swing before. Price runs out of energy to the upside. Turns back lower. We took out this prior low. I've got the minimum number of pivots, one, two, three, for a channel or actually for a median line. But you know, I, let me make sure that the low's in here. Uh, give me something, at least show me some buyers. Okay, we're starting higher. So three, por three pivots have formed, the price is starting to head higher. We see. 
let's use this high and this low. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to find the middle here. Big fancy term, I'm going to bisect it. The middle from B to C. So I'm going to mark the center here. And that's the bisect from B to C, or the middle between B and C. Then I'm going to connect it to this. This would be A. I'm going to connect it to the center of this BC swing. And I'm going to draw a line from A to the center and project it out into space and time. Let's see what that looks like. There you go. Now to make a median line, I'm going to copy this slope. And I'm going to add a line with the same slope. And I'm going to begin at the B pivot. So it'll run just like that. Let's see what that'll look like. Yeah, that works pretty good. To complete the median line, I'm going to add a line. I'm going to copy this slope here, or the slope from the median line. And I'm going to add it right to the C pivot. So they'll be equidistant between the two. I'll add it right here. Let's see what that will look like. OK. That's about right. Some people call them pitchforks. Dr. Andrews, if you said that in Dr. Andrews' living room, um, you'd get either a bad look or if he really liked you, he'd call you names. Um, never liked that la that name. But he called them median lines in, in his house. You certainly respected him. You can call it whatever you want as long as you learn to use it correctly. So now we have a median line. Let's see if it gives us the probable path of price. In other words, what we're looking for is for price to fluctuate within this median line. And note, if we're correct, just like the channel, the first channel we drew, we drew, we're hoping that we'll get the probable path of price. And if we use the major pivots, A, B, and C, it should project the probable path of price. And price should run out of energy around the major lines. Let's see what we get. So price moves above the median line or middle line. That's why it's called the median line. And it forms a pivot. It runs out of energy here. So some of you may be scratching your head. We did take out this high. We haven't met the upper parallel yet. So you might say, is this median line useful? Here's one of the first problems that I see with students. And I see with people on the internet. I see people that are even teaching. And it makes me wince. They try and be channel traders. So when they get this first move up and it doesn't make the upper parallel, they get all nervous. And they start changing and their A point, or maybe they'll pick a different A, B, and leave the same C. But they're trying to fit it to match price. And here's the important thing to understand. A, B, C. If you do the work, an amazing thing happens in median lines. 80% of the time, from the major A to B to C, actually, I take that back, from any A, B, C. Once price heads higher, if it's an upsloping median line, it will make the median line, or its next most likely line, as Andrews would say, 80% of the time. Now, we've done statistical research on this for forever. I've been doing it since computers were powerful enough and cheap enough, so the mid-1980s. And we've run this, I can't tell you, on, on everything that moves. Anything that fluctuates, as Dr. Andrews would say. And the, the low end is 72%, the high end is 87%, and the median or middle is, of course, 80%. 80 so with 80% probability, we'll meet the next most probable line. Let's see what we do with that. Well, price turns back lower and runs out of energy. Now, do yourself a favor. Slide back three, four feet from your desk and just eye this rascal up. 
those of you that are wondering, well, should I draw a different one, maybe A, B, C, because we did make this upper parallel, just slow down. Take a look. As above, so below. This was translated out of the original language by Sir Isaac Newton. And, in fact, he built his principles of physics off of much of this book, the Emerald Tablet. And as above, so below can be translated into for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Now take a look at this swing. It's centering around the median line or middle, and you can see close enough for jazz, as they say, it's about equal on the upside and the downside. So we're still getting plenty of frequency here. We could draw a circle around it, you'd see it even better. Let's see what price gives us now. Price fluctuates above and below the median lines and it's parallel. Now it breaks to the upside, takes out this high and heads higher. And again, everyone's all excited. Pardon me. Because it broke above the upper parallel. But it's run out of energy. And in the scheme of things, the width of this median line to upper parallel, we're just barely above it. This is real life. This swing actually comes from a recent 240 minute oil futures chart. Real life is a little bit messy at times, but that, that doesn't mean we can't use it. This amount, just as these swings were similar and it tells us something about the market, the amount that we've penetrated above this upper parallel, if we pay attention, may be useful to us. If we just slow down and let the market talk to us, understand the language of price. Price comes down, runs out of energy, heads lower, comes down, breaks through the median line. Now, take a look. As above, so below. We call this the slop, big technical term there, so the slop in intrinsic. It's the baggage that this median line carries. But you'll see this a lot. You can see the same frequency. This will help you decide where to put your orders once you've decided that you have a median line that's working for you. Don't believe me? Let's take a look. Price climbs higher, tests the prior high, a little bit higher, and I'm going to give it to the test of the upper parallel. That's close enough for us. Yes, a lot of times it will touch it exactly, but this is you know, in the scheme of things, a couple ticks, it's no big deal. Let's take a look. Price runs out of energy, heads lower. What do we have? Take a look at our overshoot. Take a look at our overshoot. Take a look at our overshoot. They're very similar. And this tells us something. As above, so below. As I said, this is the slop attached to this median line. You should expect that this median line is going to be precise within about this much on the upside and the downside. You don't have to run and draw a new median line. Relax. Listen to price. Let it tell you what it's thinking and doing. Traders that focus on using channels in their trading are constantly curve fitting their lines. They draw them, they redraw them, they make them fit, they doesn't fit, they draw a new one. That's the nature of using channels. Now, sadly, again, I'm going to repeat myself. Most traders that use median lines are constantly drawing and redrawing. They're curve fitting their median lines instead of taking time to read the language of price. If they take the time to learn the language of price, then they know where to place the median line, so it tells them the probable path of price. Even when price violates a median line, 
as it did here and here, price has given us clues about where price is likely headed. This is not about curve fitting lines so that price stays within a median line. Slow down, think, and understand where and why a median line should be drawn. Then let price interact and watch and listen as the language of price unfolds in front of you. Now we're going to go through the five major principles that Dr. Andrews put forth in his work, Action Reaction, in 1965. So we'll look at the daily charts of crude. These are daily charts on crude oil. You, you can even go back and do them yourself because I've left, uh, I'm sure I left the uh, dates on it. And you can identify them, go back and do your homework. In fact, there's even going to be a couple pieces of homework in here. You don't have to turn them in to me, but please take the time as you go back over it, grab the slides, and then put up your charting software and draw them yourself. So let's see, let's go through it. So Dr. Andrews gave us five key principles to help us see the probable path of price. And this is on, on our website. Uh, it's free. Um, copyright, 1966. And I, I, I know the charts look a little frail, a little maybe hard to understand, but remember, he was drawing on paper. And these come from the 1960s, 1970s. This one's 1965. And they've been beat around and passed around and then finally copied. But you can read the whole course. And this is, I think, the key page to get you started. There's a high probability that prices will reach the latest median line. Prices will either reverse on meeting the median line or gap through it. And I would add, either reverse on meeting the median line, accelerate, comma, or gap through it. Because we trade 24 hours now. When he was trading and writing this, of course, there, was, there were no overnight sessions. When prices pass through the median line, they will pull back to it. Let me read that one again. It's very important. When prices pass through the median line, they will pull back to it. When prices reverse before reaching the median line, leaving a space, they will move more in the opposite direction than when prices were rising toward the median line. Prices reverse at any median line or an extension of a prior median line. Now note when he says median line here in writing, he means a median line or a median line parallel or a warning line. So let's take a look. I'm going to get a drink of tea. We'll go. All right. Price is in an uptrend. You can see we've made a low here, higher high, come back, can't make anything near a lower low. Take out this high, can't make a new lower low. Now we're trading in a range. We make a marginal new high after making a slightly lower low, but really haven't broken any swings because you can think of this as crawling higher. I'm going to call these triple tops. They're all within a few ticks of each other. We head back lower. It's not a swing low because we haven't really taken out the prior swing high. That's what confirms swing lows. We have to take out a swing high. Same. The opposite applies with swing lows and highs. Then we come down, break the swing low, which confirms this is the swing high. Turn around, and this is always a key for me, and we've talked about this in the last three sessions here at IB. Gaps are very important, and Dr. Andrews taught that gaps have two pivots in them, a low and a high pivot. And in fact, when you're drawing, if you need it, you can always use the center as well. But they're very, if they stay open especially, they're very key when you're drawing. You can draw down here, you can draw over here for your A, but you can always use either one of the 
pivots in a gap because this is where price began its run higher and took out all the highs on this wide range bar right here. I'm going to use the bottom of this wide range bar, which is the high of this gap, as my A pivot. Then I'm going to use the first swing available, which is from this B to this C. I'm going to grab the extremes from this first swing, mark them as B, C. And as we did earlier, I'll bisect the middle. Now, on most charting programs, you won't have to do this. You can just open up the median line tool, tap the bottom, tap the top, tap the bottom. It'll give you a pitchfork or a median line, and you're in business. But if you're doing it by hand, you bisect the BC, mark the center, come back to the A, project it forward. That gives you the slope. Copy it out, B, copy it out, C. Now we've got our median line. This tells us the probable path of price. Now remember, the median line acts as a trend tool and a trend barrier. That means when the median line gets broken, of course, we can take another look at drawing something different. But if that doesn't work, hi, Cynthia. Well, <laughs> I don't know what that means. When that doesn't work, at that point, I'm going to open up my champ panel, make sure I'm okay. I haven't been a bad boy. Nope, I guess not. Okay, so if this doesn't work, we can try something different. Let's take a look. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at something called a modified shift median line from this low, this high, and this low. Now, let me give you all a treat, those of you that have been coming to the seminars. At Market Geometry, of course, um, there's myself as well as my partner Shane, and we try and do our best to show you exactly how we draw. Let me show you a tool that I was recently able to talk about that had, I was unable to share until recently because um, it's under copyright restriction, and uh, I believe in copyright laws. And luckily, one of the students at the premium sessions asked a question, sent me an email, and it opened the door for me to share this really neat tip on median lines, which if you're just starting out also with action-reaction lines, you'll be very interested in. So let's take a look. Here's a modified shift. Let me go back and show you. Here's the traditional and the same pivots. Here's the modified shift. And the difference is literally we're just going to go toward the B, C swing. We're going to go up 50% and over 50% toward C, over 50% toward C. Up 50%, over 50%. That gives us a new A. Yet the testing, the statistical testing, shows us that this median line, which we call a modified shift, holds up with the same statistics as a traditional median line. A, B, C, 50% prof probability of reaching the median line. Now, here's a little tip that we, I know, I know from spending all the years, in fact, I was there when Jeremy Schiff first presented his statistical research to Dr. Andrews, and he said originally, let's just go up 50%, so his A would be over here, Dr. Andrews went back and did some research and came back and said, no, let's go up 50% and over 50%. And let's see why Dr. Andrews would be interested in that. Remember, median lines have geometry built in, which gives them a probability from the moment you draw the A, B, C, unlike channels where you have to draw them and they have to get tested and you have to make decisions. You know with statistical probability that once you draw it, price will meet median line 80% of the time. So Andrews took a look and said, mm, I like this idea that Schiff has, put the A over here, but if I put the A up 50% and over 50%, it actually does what I'm trying to do, which is draw price through the middle or the median line in the case especially where price is 
go vertical as they did here. So by going up 50% and over 50%, I'm going to capture the middle of this entire price move. And it projects the path of price much better. But here's what really caught his eye. If you, before you even draw this modified ship, if you want to know, a lot of times if, you, if you're at the website and you watch during the premium sessions or you watch me draw here, you wonder how I can see median lines and modified shifts in my head and know which one to draw so quickly. It's because to find the slope of a modified shift median line, all you have to do is connect the A to the C and project it forward. You don't have to even up 50%, over 50%, bisect the BC connected. You don't have to do any of that. You literally connect the A to the C, project it out. You've got the line already. You can see that in your head. Take a look. A to C, just project that out in your head. Then just copy it over to the high. You can do this in your mind. Then just eyeball, where's the middle? Oh, there it is. And you'll have your modified shift without doing any of this. You can do this while you're just looking at the chart with a little bit of practice. This is what caught Andrew's eyes immediately. He liked Jeremy Schiff's idea, but the moment he started to do research, he said, hey, this does exactly what I want. It gives me the median or middle movement, and I can see it right away. I can see how valid it is. A to C gives me exactly the slope of the line. So this is wonderful. And again, where do we find it useful? especially when we go vertical in either direction or with price gaps like this. It's very, very useful. So let's see. You can see where price ran out of energy right at the prior swing high, and we're clumping right around the median line. Yeah, have we violated a little bit? Yeah, a little bit, but that's okay. It's real life. Let's see what it gives us. So take a look. Lots of tea. It's a little bit warm here. So price is in a strong uptrend. The modified shift median line projects the probable path of price, this type of movement. It's like a sine wave inside of there, coiling around. It will tell us the state of the trend. What does that mean? Well, it means that price is in an uptrend until it's not. Newton's, one of Newton's laws. Price is in motion and it tends to stay in motion. It's not going to stop. It's not going to change direction until another force causes it to stop or change direction. So price is likely to trend higher and it did. Once we found the probable path of price, take a look. Came down, bubbles up, as Shane would say, comes down, tests the lower parallel, comes with 80% probability, comes back to the median line, done what it's supposed to do. Now, at some point, another force does enter the market, and price does turn, makes the lower parallel, so it makes the median line with 80%, makes the lower parallel with 80%, but this time, there are no buyers. And what had been resistance, and the first time around became support, this time around, there's not one buyer, and look what happens. Goodbye. Price is in an uptrend until it is not. So the median line gave us, it's a trend detector. We're in a trend. It's a price barrier. You can see it showing you where price will run out of energy, showing where price will run out of energy. But it also tells you the game is over. When? Here, it's cracking, and it's gone. How do we deal with that? So the median line is a trend barrier because it gives you the areas where price should run out of energy to the upside and the downside. It acts as a balance line, and the median line and its parallels will alert you when a trend change takes place. A trend change has taken place. Look at it. So what happens when a trend take change takes place? Well, that's all right. We can draw again. We'll wait for the market to give us a clue. We'll draw another one. Here we are falling off a cliff. We'll grab this extreme, this extreme, this extreme. Bisect the BC, 
project it forward from the A handle, draw it in, connect that same slope line to the B, same slope line to the C. Now we have our new median line. And we know from Dr. Andrews' work, remember the first principle, there's a high probability that price will reach the latest median line. And you can see price comes up and makes the median line. Price did what it's supposed to do. The median line is a trend barrier. The median line and its parallels will alert you when a trend change takes place. But most important, number one, price will reach the latest median line, right here. Look at it dance along the median line. Now it swings lower, and if it comes off of this median line, it should then reach the lower parallel. Again, 80% probability. So price comes, we draw on a new median line because there's a possibility that we've run out of energy. A B, C, you can see price swing and test this energy point, which is where price and an upsloping line of force and a downsloping line of force meet, price is attracted to the area where they cross. We call it an energy point. Price gets attracted, that's our test of both the downsloping upper parallel and, again, the median line. We come off, we swing back up, we get tested here. By the way, if you have good eyes, this is a beautiful entry with a very achievable stop right here. And where's price going? At minimum, to this lower parallel and perhaps to this median line. Again, there's a high probability the price will reach its latest most likely line, and it did here. Let's see what we get. We drew in the red downsloping median line. What did I say? It should at minimum meet this lower parallel and probably also meet this red downsloping median line after testing the upper parallel, and let's see what we got. We came. There should be buyers here. There are no buyers here. That tells us that the median line of its parallels will alert you when a trend change takes place. This is the median line alert. Hey, I'm sorry, this median line is no longer in force. It's no longer working. Same as over here. Now price sprints to the downside. It makes its target of the median line. And this is extremely important in the proprietary trading that I do, and I'm a sovereign wealth fund trader, for those of you that don't know, it's extremely important. This is one of my favorite entries, a zoom and retest. We come through the median line with lots of force. We accelerate through. What did Andrew say? Prices will reverse on meeting the median line or gap through it. In this case, and I added earlier, accelerate. Get it came to the median line and accelerated through. That's the second principle. The third principle, when price passes through a median line, price will pull back to retest it. Look at price accelerate through and come back and retest it. If you have a stop, and in this case, structure doesn't line up the way we like it, this is a wonderful area to enter a trade if you didn't enter up here. Now, homework. This is for you guys. When you get when you leave today, as you exit, I be the nice program that Cynthia has taken taken time to put together for you will automatically ask you, do you want to save the slide? Do you want to copy the slides? You know, if you forget, you can always come back, use the link that's there, that Cynthia will send you later on in the day. You can always come back um, and pick up the slides then and or watch it over again. But do yourself a favor. Print this slide out. You can even go back. Look, this is uh, must have been 2011. 
you can go back and print this out. This is daily continuous crude oil. Print it out and put these circles on the chart. First of all, draw on the median lines. Put these circles on the chart. See if you can figure out what's going on. Here's the major class rules that we used. One, two, three, and five. We haven't got to four yet, but price will reach the latest median line. Price will either reverse on meeting the median line or gap through it or accelerate, as I said. Three, when prices pass through the median line, they will pull back to retest it. We haven't gotten to four yet. Five, prices reverse at any median line or extensions of a prior median line. I'll let you go back and see if you can figure out what's going on in each one of these circles. Mark it up. Take your time. Draw in the three median lines. Do your homework. This is what Dr. Andrews would send us home with. He wouldn't circle things because we actually had to work on paper, but he would say, hey, you know, when we meet next Tuesday, tell me what you think this chart's telling you. What's going on at all the important places? That's what we'll discuss next week. And you better come prepared if you're going back to his house the next Tuesday because he taught using the Socratic method, and so you're going to get lots of questions from the teacher. So, that's your homework. You don't have to send it to me, but do yourself a favor. Again, you have to, if you want to be a consistently profitable trader, you have to master yourself, you have to be responsible. If you're interested, do your homework. Okay. So here's another extra Andrews tip. I didn't put this in the five principles, but it's extremely important, very useful, and one you don't see, you know, you're not going to see this from other people that are out there touting that they understand what pitchforks are all about um, because they weren't students of Dr. Andrews. They just they read a little bit of the course material and start charging people to come on over. Me, I'm in the give back period of my, my life, so I, I, I don't hold anything back. I'm giving everything I know away. I'm setting it free. So let's take a look. If price crosses an, a, a median line, this is called a median line or a median line parallel, this would be the median line parallel. If price crosses it and then begins to move along it, like it is here, we call this trading the switchback. Big fancy move for moving along it. Enter when price is reversed by, use, by the use of a sliding parallel, which in the shorthand would be SH. The shorthand for this upper parallel or this lower parallel would be MLH for median line parallel, okay? So price has made the lower parallel. You can see it accelerated through, came back to retest, came up to the upper parallel, pulled back a bit, stayed within the uptrend, broke out of the upper parallel. Now we're crawling along it. What's a trader to do? Sure, you could draw a new median line but we'll give you another tool as well. If price crosses the medium line parallel and then moves along it as it is doing here, enter when price is reversed by the use of a sliding parallel. Now, at the moment, it's possible that price is going to continue lower, and the way we deal with that is we just assume that this medium line has shifted up by this amount. That's why I draw on the sliding parallel. What we want to know is if prices has if price has changed trend, so we want, we're using this as a trend detector, and we get more upward movement, we break above the sliding parallel, how do we get in? Andrews gives you the clue right here. Watch what happens. As I said, we can draw in a new median line from this low where we tested the, the lower parallel. The first high outside of the median line, our pullback low, take a look at our sliding parallel. If we just went long, once we broke out of here, of course, we would have got shagged out and left holding the bag. Instead, we wait patiently, we mark our swing highs, swing low, swing high, swing low. What do we have here? We have a prior low that's tested. We make a new low. We barely make a new low. To me, these are the same new lows, same lows. This is where the big boys are buying when what I call wholesale. Whales are buying wholesale. But this probably doesn't work for most traders. It, to them, it looks like a shot in the dark. But somebody has a reason 
to buy at this level, the whales. Now we take out this high, and more importantly, we break above the sliding parallel. This is the trend detector in use. When we break out to the upside, we watch carefully what does price do for us. The first thing it's supposed to do is make it to the median line. And you can see price makes it to the median line, and 80% of the time it does it. And how many times have we seen this on this? This is just one series of up and down median lines. Price makes it to the median line with 80% probability. It pulls back. We mark that when this high gets taken out, this becomes an official swing low. So we mark the swing high, mark the swing low. This gets taken out, this high. That makes the swing low important. Now we can connect the line from this breakout low right here where we're retesting the sliding parallel. We break out of the sliding parallel, now we retest, connect that with this swing low, project it out into space. Price comes up to the median line again. We're hoping for another pullback. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we don't, but if we do get it, we can get long at this sliding parallel, put our stop underneath this swing low right here, beautiful minor swing low. Should be buyers now that we've crossed above the trend barrier. Here's a sliding parallel. Here's our entry. Let's see what we get. You can see if you didn't enter here, it was pretty hard to get aboard. But I'll show you an alternate in a second. So let's take a look. There's a high probability, <coughs> excuse me, that price will reach the latest median line. Price will either reverse on meeting the median line or gap through it. When price passes through a median line, price will pull back to retest it. And you can see price passes through the gray median line, the trend barrier. And we expect that price will retest the green median line, and we may enter there. So in this case, here's our sliding parallel entry. Now price accelerates through the median line, picks up steam. We still expect it to come back and retest anytime that it zooms through. So we've accelerated through. We expect a retest. If we get a retest, if we can afford the stop, this is a wonderful place to get long. Price comes up. We expect a retest. Sure enough, here's our secondary entry. This is a beautiful entry off the sliding parallel, which is one of Dr. Andrews' favorite techniques. Here's our zoom and retest, one of my favorite techniques. You can afford to stop if you miss this nice little surgical entry. Sometimes it doesn't give it to you. This is the secondary entry. We zoom above, we come back and retest it. Grab your position, hold on. Where do you expect price to go? Price should make its next most likely line, the gray upper parallel which also marks what should be an extreme. And if you look at these bars, look what happens when we go vertical. Look at this bar and then this bar. Generally, we pull back. Look what happens when we go vertical. We go vertical, generally, we pull back. Look at us go here. We get on a big run. As soon as volatility increases and we go vertical, we take our money here. It's at the upper parallel and price has gone vertical. We expect but at some point, we're not predicting, but we expect price was is reaching an extreme somewhere. It might be here, it might be higher, but and we're also, by the way, take a look. Draw a line across. We're at prior highs. You have to pay attention to that. We expect the price will run out of energy somewhere up here. So we're going to enter here on a retest. Price gets to its extremes. We're going to take our money and run. If it goes higher, the people that caught this. God bless them. We don't care about that. We got our piece. We framed our trade. It's this bit right here. That's what makes us rich. If we can, if we can catch this on a consistent basis, that's all we need. It doesn't matter what price does after this. If we can frame out our trade and do it, make it, and have good risk reward and good money management, we're all good. That's what trading is about. So we get in here on the retest. We're out at the upper parallel. 
We're out clean. Let's see what price does for us. That is right over here. We come up. We get long here. Price zooms up. Comes to the extreme. Take a look. Heads lower. And interesting enough, while our trade, we might not have got stopped out of our trade if we just left it at break even or at our original stop loss. What does price do? It does nothing. It trades sideways. Now, why is that? When price makes a long sprint in either direction, it's expending energy. Just like if you get in the car and drive, I live in Arizona, I live in the middle of Arizona. If I drove from here to the Grand Canyon, by the time I got to the Grand Canyon, my car would be out of gas or my truck. Trees don't grow to the skies. You can't drive your car forever. You run out of energy. It's the same thing with price. Price zooms up, meets its extreme. Then it has to restore its energy. So in this case, what we see often, take a look. When price stays within a range, and this is my, these are my words, it's restoring its spent energy. The median line provides time for price to rebuild energy. Price moved from the upper median line, upper median line parallel, to the lower median line parallel while trading within the range, while it restored energy. We got long here, pitched them out here when it got to its extreme. Now, what does price do? Nothing. It trades within this nice range. What's it doing? It's restoring its energy. Now, you may wonder, is there any place that I can trade here? Sure. There are lots of smaller trades in here that you could frame out, depending on what's going on. You may or may not be interested in them. But when we get over here and we've made our sprint from upper parallel to lower parallel, at that point we might actually be interested in trying to frame a trade because price should run out of energy to the downside at this lower parallel just as it ran out of energy to the upside at this upper parallel. So price is now, we call it going blue to blue. Thank you, my buddy Andy, back of the CME. That's a Chicago term. In other words, it went from this parallel to this parallel. That's blue to blue. And as it gets closer to this one, it makes us scratch our head and say, hmm, maybe this is an area that I might want to think about a trade. Well, I could just use this gray upsloping median line, but another way to do it is we can draw an inner smaller median line. We can draw a minor median line set inside the larger gray median line. All median line sets carry the same probability. So even in this new inside median line, we know price will likely reach the median line. So from this lower parallel to this median line would be the most likely line. If price comes back to test the blue, minor, lower median line parallel, it would be a trade entry setup with a high probability target of this median line. So we put in an A, a BC, mark the middle of the BC, find the slope from A to the middle of BC, project it forward, drag it over to B, project it up, drag it over to C, project it up. If you have a charting program, you're probably going to just click A, B, C. It'll give you the median line. Now we take a look and we see the prior lows here. We've got a number of them stacked up and some prior highs right here. We call this a multi-pivot line. We project this out in space. And we get a nice little energy point right here where this multi-pivot line that's been tested meets with the lower blue parallel. If price gets in that area, we can get long, put our stop underneath the C pivot, and it's a very nice little high probability setup. Our target would be the median line. Let's see what price gives us. Take a look. Here we go. We want to enter long at the lower parallel where it, buy, where it has confluence with this multi-pivot line, low, 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 high, 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 and then 
You can see it comes down, gives us the entry we're looking for. Our stop would be underneath the C point. What's our path? How are we going to frame this? Here's our trade in our mind. We want to get out if price gets to the blue median line. I don't care about anything else. I'm not looking for this one. I'm not looking for any of this junk up here. If somebody else makes money up in here, God bless them. Me, I'm entering here with this stop to get out here. I'm not excited about this gap because that gap is going to push price to my profit target. Let everybody else do the happy dance. I want the give me the money dance. So price comes in, gives me the trade. Now I'm long. It's accelerating. Price is now at an extreme. We're at the median line where it should be running out of energy. I take my profit. I step aside. Price goes a little higher. That's okay with me. But I don't have to get dragged along with everybody else while I try and figure out what to do with their position. I'm in and I'm out. If I don't have these slope lines, I'm above the prior highs. Why would I get out of my position? I have the gap above the prior highs. There's no reason. I've got my stop, I don't know where, somewhere down in here. You can see it went relatively vertical, so there's no place to put a logical stop. And what happens? Price rolls over. It starts to decay. It's running out, it's run out of energy to the upside. And we get confirmation when it breaks through the upsloping lower parallel. And right about here, you're darn happy that you took your profit where you did. Because look at all the days you would have stuck with this position and not gotten anything out of it. And now it's breaking through your lines. And now you have to wonder, will the gray line hold? Is that still a trend barrier? Or, in this case, you can see it crack. And not only does it zoom through the lower parallel, what did Andrew say? If price accelerates through its next most likely line, it will come back and retest it. So we zoom through it, or accelerate through it, we come back and retest it right here. And then we head lower. We start to take out minor lows. We fill the gap. You can see all the lower lows. And now that we've broken through, you can see we made one high, and we're in a continuous group of lower lows, lower highs. Are we in a new, has the trend changed? Are we in a trend downward, a new trend? Let's take a look. We draw in, yes, we get a pullback. We draw in a new median line. This is our extreme at the prior median line, where we took our profits before. We use that for our A pivot. Here's our extreme to the upside. This is the highest high that we've made. And here is our extreme at the lower parallel as we traverse from upper to lower, blue to blue, as I said. This is price moving forward in space and working off time, if you will, while it restores its energy. A, B, C. We project it forward. We bisect the B, C, project it forward, flip it to the top, flip it to the bottom. We've got our median line. What do we know? Price will reach the latest median line. Okay, it did. Then it begins to head higher. Price should reach its next most likely line. It came from the, it met the median line. It's heading higher. It should meet the upper parallel. In fact, not only should it meet the upper parallel, but it should also test this lower parallel from the downside. Remember what Andrew said. If it zooms through, it should come back and retest. Well, now we've made progress, significant progress to the downside. As it's swinging back up, you expect a test of this lower parallel and or a test of this upper parallel. What do we get? Nothing. Big quandary. Nothing. Nothing happens. One of the every time you see a failure in price when price is making a swing, if it fails to meet its likely targets, that's generally the biggest move you'll see. Pay attention. Let me say it again. When a when you get a price swing failure, in other words, the swing failed to meet what it was supposed to do. It should at least meet this upper parallel. When it fails, generally, these are the largest moves on your chart. And this is all from someone by the name of Dr. Hagopian, right here. 
Uh, Dr. Gopin was a few years before me, and unfortunately he passed away before I had a chance to meet him. But I know from up close and personal all the people that were around, because I was in the inner circle. I know his teachings intricately, and what he was talking about was swing failures. When price reverses before reaching the median line or upper parallel, leaving a space, as it did here, price will move more in the opposite direction than it did when price was rising toward its most likely line, in this case, the upper parallel. So you can measure the distance that we moved in this direction, put it to the bottom, and you expect at least that amount to the downside, but you're probably going to get more. Let's see what we get out of this. Look at price sprint to the downside off of this failure. Price reverses, leaving a space, which causes price to move further in the opposite direction. This is the Gopian's rule. Not only did we get through the median line, we got through the lower parallel. For those of you that are unaware of what a warning line is, it's the same, it's a line with the same slope. Use the same distance projected out from the lower parallel. That's the first warning line. You can project it again. That's the second warning line. Andrews on these runaway charts would draw four out in space. And some Shane actually asked yesterday in in our live sessions at Market Geometry, why do we have the name warning line? Well, it's simple. Andrews only charted on paper. He never used charting software charting. So when you draw it with paper, you want to draw as few lines as possible. And as you draw in the bars, you want to anticipate where potential support or resistance may be. So that the name warning line comes in because you're just tootling along drawing in your bars each day. But you want to pay special attention as you get toward an area where price should do some interesting things. Let's take a look at this lower parallel. Price comes down, touches it, then reverses. You can see the little tap here. Then we accelerate through. You expect the price, as it accelerates through, would come back and retest the lower parallel. Of course, it doesn't even try. That's another sign of extreme weakness. Look at how far we've come, yet we're still exhibiting extreme weakness. Again, price accelerates. Look at it, just zoom through this first warning line. You've already have the warning line drawn in to remind you to pay attention to what happens. Take a look. Price comes and the bar, the daily bar, closes after testing the first warning line. You would expect at that point that price should reverse. Instead, it accelerates again. Your warning is, hey, pay attention. I'm at the frequency or area where price should do something interesting. And it does. It accelerates. It doesn't do what you think. But that's a clue. What's the clue? It means it's still weak. As far as it's come, it's still weak. So you draw on the next warning line. And you say, hey, I'll pay attention at the next warning line, but I expect it to get there. As it accelerates through in your mind, you should be saying, ultimately, the next warning line is where price is going to go. But what does it do? It accelerates through. And this time, it does come back to retest it. But that's what you expect. Price zooms through, then accelerates, then retests. But you would expect it to run out of energy. What does it do? It does. And where does it go? To the second warning line. Now, you pay attention, and you expect it will either accelerate or reverse and head higher. What do you get? You get consolidation, which is generally a sign. When you consolidate, it, consolidate it around one of these lines, generally it means you are going to get the reverse, price reverses, and now we're paying attention back at the first warning line. Price reversed at this line. Now we'll see what it does at this first warning line. So now you can see Hagopian's rule, and you can see how price interplays back and forth. Even though it busted through this median line, you can see the frequency still doing very, very interesting things at each one of these levels. So. Now that we've gone through the theory, I hope it was interesting. Let's see if we can put these five principles to work in an actual trade. So here you go. This is 
actual live crude, there is a high probability that price will reach the median line. And you can see A, bisect the BC, project the slope forward, put it off the B, project it forward, put it off the C, project it forward. Now I've got my median line, and I know with 80% probability we'll make it to the median line, and we do. We just went over that. That's one of the main statistical rules of median lines. When prices pass through or accelerate them through the median line, they will pull back to retest it. Here we go. We accelerate our zoom through the median line right here. We come up, we turn around, and with the same probability, we will retest this upsloping median line. So we retest it. Now pay attention. Price reaches the latest median line and it had this huge sprint higher. Look at it. October through the middle of November. Straight up. Big, beautiful, broad trend. Runs out of energy at right where it's supposed to. Look at As big as this is, as beautiful as this trend is, look at the accuracy of this. Zooms through, pulls back, gives you a nice entry, makes the upper parallel, turns on a dime. What does it do? Goes, as Andy would say, goes blue to blue. It should work its way through this median line, and it does. This is price restoring its energy. Price will reach the latest median line, and it does. Price will reach the latest median line or its parallel, and it does. Price needed time to restore its energy. Okay, we've got that going for us. We've got that locked in. Now, we can draw a minor at least compared to this blue line, a minor median line. This low, this high, this low. Here's our test up here. Here's our test down here. We're going to use this as our C pivot <clears throat> and some inside pivots for our A and B. Nothing special here. This is our widest swing. This is our, there's no other lows hanging down here, so we're going to grab this one. This low, B, C, bisect it. Flip it to the top, flip it to the bottom. Now we've got our median line. We know prices will either reverse on meeting the median line or gap through it. And price will reverse at any median line or the extension of a prior median line. So we're down at an extension of the median line, which is the median line parallel right down here. Now prices are either going to reverse on meeting the median line or they're going to accelerate through. Price turns around. We've already gone blue to blue. We're at an area where price should run out of energy. I like that. So what am I willing to do? I'm willing to get long at 96.15 where price retests, excuse me, will be the first test after I draw this inside median line. It will be the retest of the blue. I'm going to be a limit buyer at 96.15, right at the confluence where both of these median lines meet. My stop loss is going to be 94.85. And if I got filled and then immediately, price immediately spiked up and hit the green median line, I'll be a limit seller of my position at 103.65. I plan all this out in advance before I put any orders in the market. Why do I do that? Because I want to take a look at this number right here. And this comes from my other wonderful, generous mentor, Amos Hosteller, one of the first partners at Commodities Corporation. And he taught me about something really important called risk reward. And it's the engine that drives you to great profitability. If you can understand this and adhere to it, and I don't trade unless my risk reward is at least three to one. So I'm risking a dollar thirty in crude oil futures to make seven dollars fifty cents right off the bat. That gives me a risk reward of five point seven to one, which is a wonderful risk reward. If I can get that, that'd be great. Yeah, I take my money, I don't care what happens after that. That means I roll forward five point seven stops. So if you think about that, I'll let you do that work yourself. Okay. 
Price comes down, fills my order. This is four or five bars later. I get long at 96.15. My initial stop loss is 50 cents below the C pivot. That's how I chose that. I want to be below the C pivot, and I know from doing some simple statistical work that when I get below significant lows, if I get half a dollar below, that's enough slop, if you will, that I if I get stopped out, I really don't want this position any longer. It's it's past the noise factor, if you will. So my stop is going to be 50 cents below the C pivot at 94.85, a dollar 30 lower than my initial entry. Interesting thing happens though. We've gone four or five or six bars. I run my cursor up, and initially I was getting out at 103.65. By the time I get in the order. We've got an additional 15 cents. Doesn't seem like much, but I'll tell you what, it adds up over time. And I need all the money I can squeeze out of these trades to make this number go higher. It's a trend tool where we have an upsloping set of lines. If I can squeeze out every bit of profit in when I'm trading along with the slope of the lines, I'll make more and more money. It's much, very important to pay attention to that. So now I'm risking. Dollar thirty to make a little bit over. I think it's seven dollars and sixty-five cents instead of seven dollars and fifty cents. So the risk reward's even better. I'm long at ninety-six fifteen. Let's see what we get. Price zooms higher after I'm get long. Continues a bit higher, pulls back, continues, makes another new high. Now I'm very slow to move my stops because I don't want to get washed out of this trade. And this is what's called a wash and rinse. You can see price is in a nice uptrend. But if you put your stops too close, for example, some traders might initially, once they get this zoom higher, they go, hey, I got a lot of money in this trade. I think I'll move my stop from down here or maybe break even. Maybe I'll go right underneath this swing. And if it pulls that back far, I don't want, I, I want out. Well, you're guppy food at that point. The whales will wash you out a high percentage of the time. And now, there's nothing wrong with taking your profit right here, but if you're looking for a move all the way up in here, you don't want to get pushed out just by the noise of the market. So I like to wait for this first wash and rinse to happen. And after I get that wash and rinse, and then price then takes out and makes a new swing high, so it takes out these prior highs, then I'll think about moving my stop. So I'm going to go from my initial stop at 94.85, I'm going to cancel it. And I'm actually not going to go to break even. Normally I go to break even, but what I'm actually going to do is go 50% below this swing low, which is 96.32. So even if I get stopped out, it's going to be a little bit of money. But really, price has no business getting back below here, and I'm going to give it the noise quotient of 50 cents. Price has broken this high. It shouldn't take out this wash and rinse area. The whales should be buying down here people like me. Okay. Price turns higher. You can see my stop was hiding under here. What do we do? Make a series of minor highs, minor lows, minor highs. Now price gaps higher. That's significant to me. I'm going to, when price gaps higher, leaves a small consolidation area. Once it breaks that consolidation area right there, this bar that sprints higher, I'm going to cancel my 96.32 stop profit and move it up a dollar below the gap low. So now my stop profit is at 103.30. My profit order, again, I'm just going to run it. I was running it along the green median line, but I decided to go blue to blue because you can see price is accelerating in more an exponential factor, and I'm waiting for it to go vertical, and here it goes vertical. So as I place, as I'm running my cursor along here, I'm going, you know, it hasn't gone vertical yet, the gap's still open. I'm think instead of the green, I think we're going to go blue to blue. I think the blue median line set is in control. But even if I took my profits here, it's not bad. It's still 107 and a half. But I start thinking about the blue, so I run my cursor along. I put my profit target at the blue median line. And as I go straight up from where price is at, I put my limit sell order in at 109.06, and I get filled. And you can see price goes higher 
doesn't bother me at all. I got my piece. So I know we've gone a bit long, and I know we were long on theory and a little lo less, a uh, smaller amount of trades, if you will, uh, slides devoted to trades per se. But uh, hopefully you found it interesting. I gave you some inside tips that you probably haven't seen in public before. Um, let me pop up my chat panel. Let me give you a tip before, and again, I haven't read anything. But hopefully you guys like this. Um, Cynthia, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a quickie here. Um, Cynthia um, is about to tell you that we're all going to do about, about to do a poll. Wait, let me finish. Let, no, no, no. Let me finish. <laughs> Cynthia's about to tell you that we're going to do a poll. Inside the poll, make sure when you fill out the poll, first please fill out the poll. I don't care what your grade means, but there will be a little slot in there that lets you put in some word. Make sure you put in webinar. And it doesn't have to say me. The important thing is that you put in webinar or webcast or something like that because that will come right back to the owner of IB, and he'll say, you know what, that's Cynthia. My God, she's good. So please. Take your time and give Cynthia her props. All right, go ahead, Cynthia. Uh, no, okay, well, go thank you very much for that, Tim. I'm laughing. I don't know that uh, TP will actually read it. But um, anyway, everyone, I have just opened up that poll that Tim was talking about. We have three short questions there, and I ask that you enter or make your selections, and then make sure you click the Submit button in the lower right-hand corner of the box. That's actually what allows me to compile all of that information. Now. Um, tip for Tim, while we're going through the poll, I want you to know you don't have to scroll back up. I've compiled all of the questions, so it starts, um, so you'll see my private um, uh, chats to you so that you can take a look. So instead of scrolling all the way back to the beginning, you can start there. I've been compiling everyone's question here today. All right, poll is about to end, everyone, so if you would, please uh, click that Submit button now. <clears throat> okay, poll has ended. Now, it, uh, that polling panel is still open on your machine, but do be aware that X in the polling panel title will allow you to collapse that panel so that you can view the chat panel and send Tim any questions at this point. But Tim, those uh, ones that I sent you privately actually started from the beginning. So, if, uh, so we'll turn it back over to you to answer those questions. And then, too, for those who are interested in how to actually Access today's recording and today's webinar notes. I do want to quickly let you know they um, we are recording, and you'll all get a direct link to today's playback, so you can come back and review this event whenever it's convenient for you. Plus, I want you to watch as you exit today's webinar for a. PDF copy of the uh, slides that are available. And I think it was slide 51 that you said was for homework. So definitely make sure that you download or at least print those slides as you exit today's event. I'd be happy to show you where you'll find the um, this webinar as well as all of Tim's previous webinars recorded and archived on our webinar site. So <clears throat> with that, I'm going to take you back or get this back over to Tim to answer oh, some no. of those questions. Oh, no. Wait, I've got to ask you a question. I, I know you did all the work to compile these. Where the, how do I get to them? I feel so I'm embarrassed. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the chat panel. Double click that chat panel title bar. You'll see it on the right hand side. Uh, yeah. Um, it went uh oh. Okay. Uh, notice up at the top of the script, the top of the panels, there's yeah. a chat. You can open it up from there. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you yeah. may have just closed it all down. <laughs> That's right. You did say you closed it. But you can actually um, start from the bottom up instead of the top down because I've compiled all of the initial ones um, <clears throat> for you. Okay. It's about us. I'll, I'll do my best. Okay. How about that? We'll get through it one way or the other. <laughs> Super. Thanks, All right. Tim. All right, everybody, thank you for being patient while I fumble around with the chat questions. Let me see what I can do here. Uh, the homework leak, you just go back into the slides. Just as you exit, I'm going to call you AMF. How about that, Mr. Chung? As you exit, you'll get a prompt that says, how do I get the slide? Do you want your slide? Just say yes, and it'll download them right to you. Or 
you'll get a nice little link uh, for all the slides in about an hour or two, and you can download them all and or watch it all again. And uh, right in the middle, you'll see the homework. It's no big deal. Don't worry, it's easy. IB's made it real easy. That's what. That's why I do all this stuff with Cynthia because she just takes all the work out of there. How different is modified shift from channels? I'll just go from. I'll go from what I, what I can grab here. Rajesh says, um, modified shifts. Are, well, first of all, they the difference between modified shift or a traditional median line from channels is the moment you draw it, it has an 80% probability. There is no channel that has any leading indicator value, as you saw. And I, I wasn't trying to be glib in the beginning or or funny. Um, that's what it's like to be a channel trader. Every time you get one of those squiggles, you go, well, is this channel right? I don't really know. There's no mathematical probability. You have to curve fit it. And, you know, channels are a derivative of action-reaction lines, as are median lines. But median lines were developed because they have mathematical probabilities. So you can lean on that mathematical probability and know, hey, I know what the median line is going to do for me. I know what the modified shift median line is going to do for me. And just relax and then read price. And leave, you know, once you draw from the major, if I, I would tell all of you, if you're just learning how to trade, just slow down, draw from the major pivots, and you got not, you're got 90 percent of the way there. Then just watch, sit back and watch, and learn how to read price. Okay, um, getting lots of thanks, especially to IB. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, I don't have any scanning techniques, by the way. Wayne, Wayne's asking me for scanning techniques. Um, I just don't have any. You can you could have somebody build it for you, but I just I just, in stocks and ETFs, um, <clears throat> to be honest with you, I just page through. I'll go through something like stockcharts.com or free stock charts. Who, that's my fifth graders. I teach fifth graders. I teach about 12,000 fifth graders uh, once a month. Um, that's what I have them trade off of. And what, what we do is we look at the most, um, the most uh, charted, the top 10 most charted to the upside, most top 10 most charted to the downside stocks and ETFs and um, from one of those sites. Um, you can also go to Stock Twits and use their top 10 uh, uh, most interesting, you know, tweets. I guess is what they do. Anything that gives you what people are interested. You want to look at things that are moving. So that works. Uh, what time frame? I, it, it works on any time frame. How about that? Absolutely any time frame. You can hear da you, dailies. What's my time? Favorite time frame? Depends on the instrument. Um, Oh, Mohan says the key to successful trading using median lines is successfully in identifying the C pivot. Any tip, tips on identifying high probability C pivots? Yeah, take a look at the structure. You can see in the last trade that I did, the key is understanding market structure. And after we tested the upper parallel, when we got to the lower parallel, it made a lot of sense if you're defining market structure that price should run out of energy there. So that, that works very well. Uh, Greg Holman says, uh, we most valuable for a whole session on identifying the elusive point C. You know, Greg, we've been doing a whole series uh, of sessions. My partner and I, Shane Blankenship, have been doing a whole set. I mean, geez, we've been doing it for two months on identifying Cs. It's really not that hard, but, you know, um, that's one of the things that we do day in and day out at Market Geometry. I know a lot of people have a little trouble. Do I trade FX? Um, I'm one of the largest FX traders in the world, David, um, I, and we've Barbara and I and Cynthia have done countless um, FX futures as well as cash FX webcasts. So go back and take a look um, at uh, Cynthia will tell you a little bit how to get to. Uh, you can either come to Market Geometry and we have a list of all the IB webcasts that we've done and links to them, or Cynthia will tell you how to get to them. You can get them here. You can get them at the CME webpage. But yeah, there's all kinds of uh, FX and FX futures uh, webcasts. Um, let's see. <clears throat> And yeah, during market geometry, we trade FX all the time. In fact, recently one of our one of our most favorite is well, we've been doing a Euro series lately, Euro FX. But uh, also, uh, the Aussie has just been generating trade after trade after trade after trade after trade. So, and you know, we're there. So, are you trying to jump in there, Cynthia? I'll tell no. I get to. I'll let you keep going. No, you're doing well. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, I see lots of people here that I know. Okay, at every time, can you, you can draw two median lines, one long and the other short. Is that true? Uh, this is from Carlos. You can, you know, I generally, actually, Carlos, that's that's absolutely true. Um, anytime you have pivots, you can draw a median line. You don't have to do that if you don't want to. I, I find it um, interesting, especially if you're looking for that inside entry. Uh, maybe you don't want it. You've got a larger median line, a larger time 
me time frame median line and you don't want to trade on that larger median line so I'll go to the minor one as well certainly for entries but the one that I find most useful is to have an upsloping and a downsloping so lines of opposing force and I like to see how price interacts with, with the two so that's another way to use two but you don't need two you know a lot of people find it certainly in the beginning confusing video will be available absolutely Cynthia will be sending you a link and you'll be able to watch this whole thing over and over and over and over. Uh, when do I prefer a modified shift over the Andrews median line, says Cyrus. Um, as I said uh, earlier, I particularly like, I, I, in fact, I almost always start with modified shifts when price has gone vertical or had a long protracted uh, up or down trend with no pullbacks or then we get those long wide range bars where it's vertical, any of those situations, I generally tend to favor modified shifts. And you know, on your charting program, it may be called a modified, it may be called a 50%. Um, they're, they're all shorthand for modified shifts. Um, let's see. Uh, I haven't seen, Jeffrey says, I haven't seen many corner trades in the past 30 days, but I have seen what you covered today in the past 30 days. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it, Jeffrey. Um, da -da -da. Lots of kudos for Cynthia, thing, and I appreciate that because I can't tell you how much, how hard she works. So, uh, do zoom bars out of parallel ranges work the same as those for media lines? Do the same Andrews rules apply? Yes. In other words, Josh, good, good observation. If price accelerates out of a tight range and comes through the bottom, and accelerates or comes to the top and accelerates, then yes, you can certainly expect that price will retest the range that it's just broken out of. And that's if you, there's, if you have a an acceptable stop, that's a wonderful place to consider entry. That's a good observation, Josh. Uh, let's see. You guys, a couple of you guys are making me blush. I appreciate that. Appreciate the good work. Um, 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 um. Hi, Olga. So Greg says uh, your whale stop might be around 50 cents on crude below logical spots. Yes. So if I have, that's right, uh, that's the noise. And in our last seminar, um, my partner Shane, Shane Blankenship, did a one, I did one on money management and his half, money management and risk reward, his half was on how to figure out the noise quotient using average true range, how to separate out the size of swings and then the noise that's left over and that's what we want to try and target to understand because then when we get to the next important swing high or swing low or area of structure, we'll add that noise underneath and we know that's a safe area to put our stop. And then if it breaks through there, we want to be out. Very important. That way we don't get washed and rinsed over. Oh my God. Um, Oh, I see what you're saying, Cynthia. Now I'm seeing your private re uh, retweet or read, repost, whatever. <laughs> I get it. Sorry, now I found them. The um, effects. Um, hang on while I read these. A couple of these are long. Okay, Alan says, <clears throat> does this work in very short time frames such as five minute and 15 minute charts? Sure. Um, again, at market geometry, we have people that are very active traders and they don't like to look at dailies. We also have position traders who like to look at weeklies and monthlies. So we look at everything from monthlies all the way down to, you know, Shane trades uh, E-mini S&Ps on three and seven minutes. Me, I'm a little slower. I try, you know, I'm at like 15 minutes. Uh, works pretty well for me in the e minis, for example. Cash for an exchange. If I'm intraday trading, uh, it's a little bit of a luxury for me, but I, I tend to get it a couple days a week. I have the luxury and the fun of intraday trading. Um, and I tend to trade on, for example, in Cash FX or FX Futures. I use 20 minute charts. Those are my favorite. Um, and if you wondered, most popular chart in all of FX. Second most popular chart, 240 minutes. Why? It's half a trading day in a major money center, four hours. So I look at 20s and 240s, for example. 
and yes, that um, and yes, from Wayne, that that your good guess that was a 240 minute chart. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that the, the last the trade. Um, let's see. Yeah, and again, David asked, do I cover FX and premium membership? Yeah, it's, in fact, I would say that's our number one instrument, um, just because there's always movement in FX. We've been doing some commodities this week because. I have a very nice position in long oil, for example, right now at about 78 bucks, And that's a position that I showed everybody the entry before I actually got in. I said, you know, take a look at this because I'm, take, I'm eyeing this one up. And then, of course, got filled. And um, <clears throat> we were on vacation over the 4th of July and had a beautiful run out. Um, was able to take some nice profits, $10 higher on a bit of it. Um, and I'm on break even on the rest of it. it sh I should never get tested if I do. I want out. Just give me my money, any of the money that's left. So we did all that live. So we did crude, and I just got out of a nice grain position um, in both the beans and corn uh, with this weather. I'm out, and uh, I don't really care where it goes from here because I got my piece. So we've been doing a little bit of commodities this week, which are a little bit slower, but more classic entries. And uh, But in, interspersed yesterday, for example, we did a whole series um, after just taking a look at crude, where it was at, we did a whole series on uh, – Euro FX and Aussie, uh, because the patterns are so classic. Shane did a little bit, just like I did today, a little bit of theory. Then we broke out directly into live charts and showed um, theory into practice. And uh, so we do lots of cash FX. I mean, that's that's my bread, and that's always been my bread and butter. Um, you know, if you if you if you're asking about specific slides, it's hard for me to actually answer because. Um, you know, they're interesting questions, but to be honest with you, I, 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 you, I, I'm, I beat me. If you if you want to um, email me, timothymorge at gmail.com or timothymorge at marketgeometry.com, I'll be glad to answer your question. But specific slides, I'd have to go all the way back to the presentation. So let's see. Um, let's see. Later touches of outer lines, generally 80% of probability return to the median line that is not just the first corner of the median line. That's true. Absolutely. So if you're going from the median, from the lower parallel to the median line, 80% probability. If, you're going, if it breaks through the median line and begins to take out swing highs with 80% probability, it should go to the upper parallel. If it turns out the upper parallel and heads lower, it should make the median line with 80% probability. So all the lines, it's, uh, that's why we call it the next most likely line. The next probable line. That's Andrew's speak. Uh, why did my profit target get changed from the green line, green median line to the blue median line? That's a good question. As I said, there was nothing wrong with taking profit at 107.40, which would have been the green median line. But as I watched it, um, it's just a uh, what's the right word? It's just a style. Um, I expected price, it had consolidated a little bit. If you take a look at the chart again when you get the slides, it, it's, it had consolidated a little bit, and to me it looked like it was about to go vertical again. So I already had a profit stop underneath, and I decided to go for the extra, you know, what is it, two bucks and whatever. And um, it's just a style thing. There's nothing wrong with taking the, the 107.40. The risk reward then still would have been... Uh, I don't, even, I don't know what we finished up with, but I think it was just under 10 to 1, but it still would have been 8 or 8.5 eight to 1 or something like that. So, um, Does the median line work as well on the way down as it seems to on the way up? Sure, absolutely, Thomas. Um, again, we did Euro FX uh, yesterday at marketgeometry.com in a big way, both in theory and in actual trades. And the, you know, the Euro is against the dollar is just in a huge downtrend. And, you know, we not only had areas that we showed for entry live in the past few sessions uh, that worked out beautiful to the downside, but also um, we showed some alternate entries. And now today we're showing how they played out and where we're at in relation to the lines that we set in the motion. Oh, my God. Uh, I know Shane's recording, but he can't answer me, but months ago. Um, so. Yes, absolutely. Up, upside, downside. As Dr. Andrews would say, anything that fluctuates, any time frame, any direction, doesn't matter. You can do unemployment. You can do baseball you know, uh, statistics, anything. Median lines will capture their, the movement. It's a statistical function. Um, 
Looks like somebody was answering questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Um, if I didn't give you the exact entry price, I don't have it with me right now. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I marked on the on the actual trades. I gave you the exact trading price. Um, the others were meant more, although there were trades there, they were meant more as theory rather than practice. I, Mohan, I would not say that modified shift is a proxy for channels. Um, the difference between the two, as I said before, is that it does, in this example, they do look like a channel, but um, again, if you didn't know the geometry of, mar of modified shifts, in other words, connect the A to the C, you'd have, in terms of being a channel trader, you would have had no ability to draw that channel until price had long passed any of the entries. Um, that you could have taken off of that. So, uh, you know, it, it, unfortunately for channel traders, they're left they're left at the starting gates while the median line traders are, are are in and trading and doing their things. So, uh, Greg says, interesting question. We had Shane and I had a long discussion, and a lot of people thought it was an argument, but it wasn't. It was a discussion. What we were trying to get at was exactly what does Dr. Andrews feel. How did he do his statistics? So here's what Greg says. At what point past the corner does it enter the 80% probability? Well, here you go, Greg. This is how the original statistics were done. You have to put some rules around it. That's the, the bane of doing statistics. I mean, he had a group of uh, graduate students doing the statistics on, you know, they, back then they didn't have computers, so they were using basically uh, lined pads of paper and pencils and I, I own a lot of that work I have a lot of it so I, I've gone through it over and over I've over a million pieces for, uh, from him Roger Babson and George Marischal and uh, what they did was when they did the original statistics is when they looked at what they thought would be an area where price should run out of energy they draw on the median line and then they would not draw it unless price took out the high of the bar from where they were looking at price turning. So if price came into an area and it should turn there, the mo once the bar closed, the moment price took out that bar, that first bar that they were going to use as their C pivot, then they would draw on the median line. And they would do, if, if price broke through, then they would call, they would mark that down as a failure. So the moment it took out the high of the bar where they were forming C, the median line is on at that point, and then they would do their statistics from there. So it's very, very early. Now, later on, I did another study, and this is where Shane and I got into a, a bit of an argument, because um, in my book, that's exactly what I show in my book. However, later on, I did another study, and what I said was, in order to understand how a trader used it, I went back and did the statistics and said this, I'm not going to do use this consider this a valid median line until price tests it or the uh, uh, median line up above until price tests it or the upper parallel until price tests it that's when I considered it a viable median line uh, and then did the statistic off of that and surprisingly enough the statistics came out exactly the same so in point of, point of fact it really doesn't matter as long as you've already formed a C pivot and then taken out one high the statistics remain constant. So, interesting question. Probably more than most you wanted to know, but there you go. So to show gaps on futures, we need to use regular trading hours, correct? Well, there are still gaps. Don't for, don't don't kid yourself. There are, you know, the CME actually closes for, for example, E-mini S&Ps. Um, the CME closes for 15 minutes, 3.15 to 3.30 Chicago time. Um, and there's, that's a lot of times earnings are announced there, so there's sometimes gaps in S&Ps, and especially in the last couple of years, you're seeing more and more gaps. Um, certainly over the weekend, you get lots and lots of gaps lately in all, all the instruments. The, market, the markets have become more volatile. But 
if you if you like trading off of gaps, I do. I know my partner does. You can certainly use regular trading. In other words, um, pit only hours. Yeah, absolutely, and that will give you more gaps. And I like to do that, but that works as well. Um, let's see. Are median line pitch charts available in IB charting, and when will they be? Jorge, how are you? Um, they are not currently available. However, you could easily do them with their line tool, which is why I went out of my way today to talk about bisecting. Just take a simple line, pick out your B and C pivots, bisect it, then find the center, which is bisecting it, connect it to the A, project it forward with a simple line, copy that line, move it over to the, C, the B and the C. So take some time, slow down. When you're not trading, use the IB platform. You can draw it very, very easily, almost as quick as you can use uh, a charting tool. But Cynthia and I both talk to tech people at IB, and eventually they'll be available. We're working on it. And Tim, could I jump in here for just a moment? Course. Because for the IB traders, I do want you to know when you draw that trend line in IB's charting, you can simply right-click, and you'll find in the right-click menu um, to create a parallel trend line. So that will definitely allow you to uh, create that line, duplicate it, and then find uh, bisect it as well. So I um, did want to give you that tip. Tip: A right-click on the line will allow you to um, create a parallel line. I, I, that's why I love Cynthia. You know what, Cynthia? You and I are going to have to do a quick little uh, ditty together, and uh, maybe we'll do it and then use it in one of the in the next presentation or one of these presentations coming up, and then uh, just put it out there. Well, Tim, uh, since you mentioned presentations coming uh, up, yes. I'm actually going to jump in here, but I'll give you an opportunity to uh, review those charts. But I did want to uh, very quickly show folks where you can access. We've got quite, we're building quite a library with Tim's presentations, yeah. and he has graciously um, offered to do these on a monthly basis. Now, right now, we have Tim the second Tuesday of every month, and I IB clients will actually get our email blast at the end of each month with direct links to sign up. But I do want you to know that they will be available. If you're not getting our email blast, they will be available on IB's website by the first of each month. So I would like to take just a minute and show you. Let me see if I can what? share some web content here. Um, uh, well, uh, actually what I'll do is I already have it up, so I'm going to quickly jump into my desktop share. Now, let's see. Let's actually bring ah, up. Uh, 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 that's what I was doing. Yeah, I was trying to keep up with them. Thank now. You, <laughs> what I did want to show you is that we do archive all of uh, Tim's events on our website. You can find it underneath the Education menu. There's a Webinars link, and when you go to that page, it actually does show you pre-recorded webinars. Now, it's, you will have to drill down a bit once you get there into the industry-sponsored events. Notice here that we do have uh, – uh, filtering criteria. This is a rather long page, but you can simply choose to filter by presenter and find all of Tim's events. So notice here, I'll simply click on it, and we've got all of these CME-sponsored events. So um, while you should watch your email later on this afternoon for a direct link to the playback, it, uh, you can always come out to our website and access these uh, recordings as well. Notice, uh, by the way, they are downloadable if you want to hang on to them and come back and review. And also, you'll find that the notes, now the last month's notes appear here, but these will appear as a drop-off link, and you can access the notes and copy, save, um, or simply print out from a browser window that will open up. Um, as you exit either the event or the recording. But keep in mind, you can always access the notes from our webinar page. It takes us an extra day, but we do send registrants the email as quickly as we can as soon as this event finishes. Now, because we've also uh, today uh, this event has been sponsored by the CME. I do want to point out there are additional CME presentations as well. So let's, uh, again, you can sponsor this time by the CME group. Now notice that in addition to Tim's webinars, we also have a monthly feature available um, on the School of Futures where we're talking about the different, we actually have CME project managers who will tell you about the different product suites that are available. So there is a 
wealth of information on our website, or as you can access the market geometry, I'm sure Tim's got quite a bit of information there as well. So let me move you back over into today's event so Tim can wrap up with those questions. So back to you, Tim. Thank you, darling. Very, very comprehensive. All right, so Ken asks, <clears throat> have you used point and figures on volume, such as shown here? Well, Ken, actually, I actually put up the money for point and figures to be developed, or not point and figures, sorry, market geometry. The market profile to be developed. So I've taken a lot of look at volume. And here's one of the problems with volume. Um, Cynthia, close your ears. Okay. Large, trader, okay. large traders or whales, unfortunately, have ways around reporting volume. And Cynthia didn't hear that, nor did the CME. And there, there are many ways, unfortunately, to distort volume be it not reporting or getting a uh, position moved from here to there so it delays being reported. And so volume is particularly not reliable. And, you know, it's kind of like floor pivots. People uh, hold up floor pivots and go, oh, my God, you know, this is a – well, floor pivots had their day, but they're long gone. Volume was more interesting when people weren't able to uh, defeat the system like they are at the moment. Um, so – if you're looking at volume in any way, shape, or form and trying to use it real time or even actually these days end of day, it's it's not particularly relevant anymore, unfortunately. I hate the, the com commitment of traders is another example. Using commitment of traders, it's meaningless. It's very manipulated. Several There's been several huge lawsuits and a couple large traders, a friend of mine, um, I mean, not close, but certainly somebody I knew in the copper markets, uh, went, is still in jail. Went away and they put him away. So. But point and figures, point and figures work wonderfully. I would say, you know, I consider myself one of the best traders in the world, but certainly the best trader that I know, a gentleman by the name of Bill Shepard at the CME, his bread and butter is point and figures. And uh, he uses point and figures and then puts pitchforks on top of point and figures. So pitch, point, pitchforks work even on point, point and figures. They work on market profile. They work on anything. So works absolutely. And can you use uh, median lines on volume? Absolutely, why not? You can use it on anything. If you can chart the volume, you can use it. But I find volume to be um, not particularly reliable. Just my opinion. Um, Nick wants to know, will the webinar be available? Cynthia just went over it. Nick, if you get lost and you can't find it, you can email Cynthia, you can email me, you can in email Barbara at the CME. Um, always time, easy to find. What time frame do I use? I use um, the time frame depending on what I'm trading and what I'm trying to achieve. If I come in in the morning and I'm only, uh, I've only got three hours, of course, I'm not going to use a daily. I'm going to use something like a 20-minute chart or a 15-minute chart. Um, let's see. Um, again, you know, people were asking about the earlier in the middle of a presentation, about this or that, but remember, I I had a specific goal in mind, which is to teach you median line theory. And so, you know, generally, and what I asked you early on, just go with the flow, relax. As you watch it the second time, try and understand that I'm I'm going through a series of median lines, and what I want you to do instead of thinking about why not this, why not that, instead, take the time to understand why I'm drawing the median line that I'm drawing, why price is doing what it's doing at those points in the median line, and see if you can understand the subtleties. Um, they're not actually subtle. They should hit you in the head. But um, we're just trying to generate enough interest from all of you to pick up the five major points that Dr. Andrews used behind his action reaction course. So there, there are lots of other possibilities. but. I'm trying to illustrate the five major principles of Dr. Andrews. So let me go back. Uh, <laughs> yes, you will be getting slides with recording, absolutely. Um, yeah. Greg says again, so later touches the outer lines, generally 80% of probability of return to the media line. Yes, the, you know, the statistic doesn't stop after it touches once. The statistic goes on and on and on. Um, uh, 
Oh yeah, you can. Anybody that wants to send me a homework, Timothy Morge at marketgeometry.com. I'd be glad uh, to see it. And uh, <laughs> you like the whale? Okay. I'd be glad to see it and glad to mark it up for you. No problem. Um, and we give out homework, by the way, at Market Geometry on the daily sessions all the time. Um, let's see. I'm trying to make sure I don't cover what <laughs> Cynthia's already pasted. I'm getting there. Hang on. Um, I, I, let me just let me just say one thing. I, I you know what? I'm not affiliated with anybody. You guys may or may not know that. I'm not affiliated with IB. I I work. Uh, I'm just trying to give back. But I will say this. <clears throat> we recently had, obviously, the failure of MF Global, and uh, most recently, I mean, it's still the smoke is still clearing. Um, we unfortunately had uh, people that are caught up. In fact, some of our members are caught up in PFG Best. Um, I, I would I would say to all of you, again, we talked about responsibility early on in the presentation. I would say to all of you, first of all, make sure that you have a an account that is. Uh, secure. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Cynthia, help me out here. Segregated. Thank you. I knew it was desperate. <laughs> Segregated, yes. And if you don't, if you don't know what that means, you can go to NFA. Dot, NFA. Uh, just, just go ahead and Google NFA uh, National Futures Association. It's something. Dot org and uh, National Futures Organization. Dot org, and um, you can just. Google what it what it means. If not, just ask your broker. It doesn't matter if it's I, you know, IB or anybody else. If you don't have a segregated account, you don't want to open an account. Period. And I know it's not going to hurt Cynthia's feelings because, you know, I know lots of people that have accounts here, and they offer segregated accounts. So do yourself a favor. Segregated accounts means everything is taken care of by the clearing corporation. Um, it's just you know. It's crossing the T's and dotting the I's. You want to make sure that you've taken care of yourself. Somebody made a comment in here that said, but apparently not PFG and MF Global. Well, you know, stuff does happen, and I couldn't have predicted that PFG or MF Global was going to fall, but we've said this over and over and over at Market Geometry and actually here at the IB sessions, make sure you open a segregated account, please. And I would say this about IB. IB, I've watched IB grow. Cynthia, you know how long I've been around? I've watched you guys grow from the beginning. I mean, I'm getting older than dirt, huh? And um, <laughs> I sometimes scratch my head, and every time I scratch my head and try and second guess what you guys are doing, it's always been golden. So do yourself a favor. Find a broker. Make sure it's a segregated account. That way you'll be protected if something does happen. Please. Okay. And I'm, I'm Tim, if, if I could put, uh, just bring something in, because someone has asked, you know, because of the current news today, I do want to point folks out to the Interactive Broker website. You'll find there's a listing there under YIB where we actually um, delineate our financial strengths, our, your account protection, um, and privacy. So uh, along with the segregated accounts, you'll see how we store your money. It's listed under YIB. IIB and IB's group strength and security. So those who do have an interest there, please take a moment and read about how we handle your funds. Um, also, do want to let you know that your accounts are segregated. Anyone who has an interactive broker's account can see that immediately when you do open up your account window screen. You'll see the securities portion of your account as well as the, the commodities portion. So please take note of that. Also, there um, after the MF Global um, <clears throat> fiasco last year, we also instituted another feature that you can access through account management, and that you can tell IB where you want any excess funds in your account swept to. It, they can be kept either in the securities portion or the commodities portion of your account. So um, the, we've instituted a lot of protections there that put you in control as well. So please check that information out on our website. Thanks, Tim. I'll get back to you. Okay. And again, let me let me just say, you know, Tom is saying that whatever. Tom, you know, the proof is in the end, or uh, proof is in the pudding, whatever the thing is. But the truth of the matter is, take responsibility. The only thing I have to say, one more time, you, people can argue about whether things were or were not segregated. Here's the important thing. 
for example, in MF Global, one of the things people found out in MF Global is they had funny ways of saying that things were segregated, and it wasn't the sta industry standard of, hey, this, uh, this is a segregated account. So they had this funny language about pools and all this other stuff. If it doesn't just simply say your account is segregated, look at the IB statement. There's no funny business. It's just straight out. Okay. Um, the moment somebody starts to dance around, you should be immediately getting a little worried. Do your homework. If the, if you have a PFG account and it was segregated, you will be fine. You don't have to say hopefully the clients will be insured. They are insured. They'll be fine. But if you did not do your homework and you do not have a segregated account, you'll have to wait for the court to do its thing. But, you know, even then, I think you'll probably be made whole by the clearing corporation. We'll let it play out. But do your part when you open an account, please. Make sure it's segregated. So, and they get the, I'm not pitching for IB, although they're squeaky clean as far as I can tell. And um, I mean, look at the education that they provide here, and their partner is the CME Group. That's that's what I love about them is they're not here pitching their accounts. They're not here trying to get you to use their charting program. They're here offering free education, and uh, that's why I'm here. I'm here because they give me a quality platform um, to share and give back. Uh, I've been doing this with Barbara since 2000. Oh my God, Barbara's, Barbara's gone, but this is going to be our 10th anniversary coming up, Cynthia. And uh, Cynthia's been there for most of the ride, let me just tell you. So, anyway, um, you still have time to show the example of corner turn for stats that is where, oh, uh, stop scrolling on me there, uh, where high is taken out and thus counted in stats. You know, you know Greg, you, you, you caught my interest. Okay, here we go. Bear with me, folks. Let me go back to something bigger. Okay. On this, where's my, where's my little bouncy thing? Oop. Like, what did I do? Hang on. Well, okay. It's not let me do what I want, but that's okay. I'll do it anyway. I'll do it a different way. On this line right here. Right in this area, you can see that price, we, where we drew the corner in, right here. And price took out that low because it's a down-sloping median line. The moment price took out that low of the bar that forms the C-pivot, when you're doing statistics, this immediately becomes a median line that's in the pool of statistics, and it will either fail or work. And in this case, you can see... Oh, no, I'm the percentage. There we go. Thank you. Sorry, Tim. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> if you could take that from the top. <laughs> okay. No, no, it's okay. So here's the bar where price formed the C, and we assumed that this was a good median line. How do we help tell whether or not it's in the statistical pool? It breaks below this bar. The moment it breaks below this bar, we put it into the blender of statistics. Okay? Then we follow it through. We'll either throw it into the fail pile or the good pile. Let's take a look what price does. Price comes down. It does come back and test it. I'll get back to that in a minute. Then it heads lower and makes the median line. So that's a success. That goes into the good pile. Now, on the second study I did, I didn't count it unless price, because I said, hey, that's useful, but, you know, a lot of times it doesn't give me any entry, any entry, so what good is that to a trader? So I said, it's got to at least come back and test the lower parallel after I draw, and it's got to be, you know, three bars out after I draw this C. So three bars out, and this one then comes back and tests it. So even on that second one, this will now go into the possible median line test. All right, it tests it. Now what does it do? It goes to the median line, gets, gets the pass. And even better for our blender, now we've broken through the median line. After starting at the upper parallel, we've broken through the median line, and we're heading lower. And we make it to the lower parallel, so we've got not only this statistic, but this statistic, so it's done it twice. Now, even better, with 80% probability as it heads higher, we should make the median line, and golly, makes the median line. Doesn't make it back to the lower parallel. It, as it heads higher, it should make the upper parallel, and it makes the upper parallel. So you can see how each of them are counted as you do statistics. Same thing here. As price, here's the C pivot. When price first takes out the tie of this bar, now it's in the blender for Dr. Andrews' statistics. 
Does it make the median line? Yes, this goes into the positive. But my second set of tests, where it has to come back and retest, so it gives it a chance to enter, it, this median line would never get into that statistical blunder because it never gave you a chance anywhere to enter. So I'm out of this one. However, once it pops to the median line, it does come back. Now I can put it in the blender and say, okay, now that it's come to the median line, it retests. Okay, good. Now I put it in my statistical blender. It makes the upper parallel. Okay, this one's a success on both of them. So hopefully that makes it clearer than mud, so to speak. If it's not clear, email me. Yes, Carolyn, or should I keep going? Oh, well, I just um, re recalled a question earlier on on this okay. slide, SH. Uh, you have oh. SH. What does that represent? This is a sliding parallel. H refers to the outer parallel on each side. He thought if you turn your head, it looks like an H. So he said sliding parallel. Medi MLH is this outer parallel. Sliding parallel is SH. For I know it's, it should. a lot of people think it should be SL, but in Andrew's speak, it's SH, sliding parallel. There you go. Good question. I missed Thank that Thank you. One. My pleasure. Uh, kind words from Matt. Thank you, Matt. And let's see. Did up, up and downs. Give me a second here while I, I'll, I'll answer, I'll, I'll answer them all. Don't worry. Hang on. There you go. Cynthia's giving out links. Okay. Uh, Satesh says no te no education will count if you you know if your money's not secured. And, you know, Satesh, I'm with you 100. percent That's that's why I would took the time to actually you know again I'm not endorsing anybody, but it's important for you to do your homework and make sure that we're talking about you know a secure environment for your money, especially these days. Anything can happen these days. I mean, geez, we had three cities in California have gone bankrupt in the last week. So yes, absolutely, please be careful. So any bar that takes out a prior bar low is a potential C pivot down, and any bar that takes up a prior high is a potential C pivot up. That is, yeah, Jan, that's true, yeah, sure. Lost me with a sliding parallel. Here we go. Price breaks out above the upper parallel of this down sloping median line. I happen to be on the right thing there for you, John. All right, so John, we break above. Then you can see it leaves lower high. So we could draw a new median line. Maybe we'd go low, high, low. But instead of doing that, again, let's pretend we're drawing on paper. And you go, you know, I really don't want to to redraw. I'd have to just completely redo this whole chart. It's a lot of a lot of bars to draw. Instead, I'll take this sloping line, and I'll just flip it over and put it on the top of these bars right here. Because take a look. They're doing a pretty good job. And you can see, for a while, price respects the whole thing. Price actually comes back and gets within the upper parallel. But it can't make it past the prior low. That leaves, we talked earlier about Hagopian's rule. And Hagopian's rule says if it can't make the most likely line, which is here, we can't get past the prior low. This is a swing failure. What happens? We should move more in the prior direction, in the opposite direction. So when we can't make it to the median line here after breaking back in, now we have a swing failure and with a great deal of probability, just about 80%, we should break the upper parallel, we should break the sliding parallel and keep right on going. And you can see this swing failure led to a bigger move than we had in this direction coming off the sliding parallel. You can use the same rules for this. So hopefully that cleared it up for you, John. Uh, let's see. Scott wants to know, do I still update my charts by hand and end of day, and are they day session only? Thank you. Um, Scott, I do, <clears throat> excuse me, the charts that I keep, I keep them on 27 instruments, are end of day, dailies, weeklies, and monthlies. And yes, I do update them. Um, I don't recommend that anybody starts this pro. I think it helps me tremendously, but I don't recommend anybody else start it because I've been doing it since 1980. It still takes me about an hour, hour and a half a day. Um, at this point, actually, my son, Sean, who's just about to turn 14 and is trading, as a matter of fact, 
Um, and we should, we every once in a while will flash one of his tra one of his trades up on market geometry. In fact, actually, Cynthia, uh, we did uh, one of the oil trades we did was actually Sean's, not this one, but um, the one about uh, uh, we were saying the Arab winter when everybody was talking about Arab spring. We did a beautiful oil trade that was actually one of my son's trades. Um, so he actually helps me update my uh, hand charts. That takes a little bit of time off my uh, my hour and a half. It gets it down to about an hour or so, but it's it's a it's a lot of work. By the way, for everyone paying attention, I believe that was the uh, next move in crude, which was the March webinar. So if you want to go back to that March webinar, you can find the trade that Tim was talking about. Yep. Thank you, Darlene. I appreciate it. See, she knows her stuff better than I do by far. Oh, the work counts? Okay. Um, You know, Jan, I'd like to answer your question, but I really don't know which chart you're talking about. Um, Ken says, not sure if you got to this question. Second pane has a pitchfork drawn on cumulative volume. Ooh. Uh, okay. Oh. I and see. I, well, I'll look at it. Hang on. Okay. I'm looking at cumulative volume. Um, hang on, folks. I'm looking. I don't know if anybody else can see it. Uh, well, again, l let me go back to what I said earlier. That's fine, except for except for one thing, Ken. And, and I, I mean this. Um, <clears throat> I, I I mean this um, sincerely. It doesn't matter if it works for you. That's fine with me. But. I, I can tell you, I'm an extremely large trader. In a lot of markets that I trade, I'm one of the, you know, three largest traders in the market in the time frame. Um, you, you, if you were in my position, you would see it's so easy to manipulate volume. Uh, it's easy to trade outside the market. Um, a lot of my trades are not reported. Um, they have fancy names for it. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I don't even go there. I don't even think about that stuff. I've been doing this for so long that I do have all kinds of. Uh, grandfathering, which allows me to do what I think are foolish things, but that's the way the exchanges are set up. It's okay with me. Um, but so volume is not really a representative uh, statistic as far as I'm concerned. So I really don't look at it. If it works for you, that's fine with me. I don't. I, Ken, I looked at the chart, but I don't think I can show it to everybody else. So anyway, um, I hopefully that answers your question. Agopian's rule. At what point does it? signify a failure to reach the median line and not just a normal fluctuation. Um, <clears throat> well, on this chart here, when we start to take out these lows right here, this swing now has the duty when we take out these lows. Because look, we came down and we made it all the way back up above the upper parallel. So when we come back and take out this low, this swing's job is to take out this prior low and make it to at least the median line. It should make at least a new low, which it really doesn't. And it should make the median line. Okay. At this point, its future is mapped out for it, and it fails. And as I said, failures give you the biggest move, almost always. So again, when you start to take out prior lows, and I, I can't give you a percentage. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't work that way. But the easiest way to think about it is, look at this is a vertical drop. There's no swings in here at all. Then we come all the way back out. Now we head in and we crack that low. The moment we take out that low, this is in play. We should be going to the median line. And the prior low stops it. Dead in his tracks. Whales were buying here. Stopped it, turned it around. At that point, this is a Hagopian's rule or a swing failure, and we should be heading on down. But we don't. Instead, we move much farther in the opposite direction. I hope that answers it. Hey, Ouija. Well, Ken, you know what? Keep working on it. Ken says it's a work in progress for him as well. Well, you know what? Keep working on it, and you know, come to some more events, or pop over to Market Geometry, or drop me an email. Let me know what you're seeing. I'd love to see some. Um, do I train or mentor students? Naveen says, yes, actually, we have mentoring. Um, we have, um, we do two things. We have uh, Shane and I tag team mentor, you know, we do it as, a, you know, he, you see him one one time, then you see me the next time. We do them in blocks of 12. 
it, it's online live and you get a recording just like here. And we do it in blocks of 12s. Or you can also do it with me directly. Um, yeah, if you want, you can email me or you can stop at Market Geometry and drop me a line there. I'm not trying to sell books or anything here. I'm just trying to, you know, give out free education. Um, let's see. Ouija says, hey, Ouija, how you doing? How can you become a whale? Someone's there. You get lots of money. That's all. Um, and I have my my money comes from four sovereign states, so to speak. Um, how does the use of a sliding parallel act as a trend barrier fit in with the observation that price often moves downwards along a down sloping upper median line parallel after price breaks through it? The key, once you draw on the sliding parallel for me, is this. This is what I like to do. You can see price come through, and at this point, you may still be on the sidelines trying to decide, do I want to draw a new upsloping median line or do I want to draw, so draw a sliding parallel? So at this point right here, I'm probably not drawing anything. The moment you can see us test this upper parallel and then start to head higher, at minimum, I'm going to draw a sliding parallel. I'm going to do something. And the easiest thing to do is just copy the slope that Cynthia was talking about and place it here as a sliding parallel. And you can see it works out pretty good. And we come back and retest it. So I'm pretty happy with it at this point. So at this point, this is a trend barrier to me. I don't want price to violate this in any way, shape, or form. If it does, then I have to draw in the upsloping median line. And hopefully, I don't have to wait for a test down <laughs> here. Instead, I can draw on a new sliding parallel, which is right off of this area where we came back, popped through, and then retested. And then we come back and test it again. Now I can pass out a new sliding parallel. And this gives me an inside, this is like roll up your sleeves type entry. So you know, this is a bit advanced. And you have to work with some charts to begin to see this and be confident in median lines and sliding parallels. It's just one way. If you miss this entry, that's fine, because you know what? This one's right in front of you. And this one ain't bad either. You know, you look at you're getting 90 to 104. That's not bad days work either. So, yeah, it acts like a warning. Exactly, BG. Um, let's see. Did we get anything there? Oh, thank you. Thank you. I got a sh sh chapeau off from Tom. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to page through real quick. Uh, let me see if anybody, if you have any more, put them up real quick here because I'm looking. But Do you see anything uh, that pops out at you there, Cynthia? Hey, John, how you doing? John Cooter, Rebecca. Oh, I'm talking, and I'm sorry. sorry I had my phone mute. I That's think you've right. covered an enormous amount of information here today, Tim. And I want to echo what Tom was saying, too. You're a wonderful and patient instructor, so thank you so much. And also, what I would like to do, because we, I think we could keep Tim here all day, all night, and into tomorrow as well. But we are going to end up concluding today's event. I'll turn it back over to Tim in just a minute. But I do want to express a great deal of thanks to Tim Morge at Market Geometry for taking the time out every single month to bring and uh, putting this presentation together and to freely give and answer your questions. I also want to thank the CME group because it's their dedication to education that actually made today's event possible. So a terrific uh, group of folks to partner with as well. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to you to wrap it up here today, Tim. Thanks. Thank you, Cynthia. You know, what gets left out in all of this is all the time and energy that you put into this. I mean, even just you know, holding my hand, you said, here, uh, a huge number of hours. This is a huge, and you know, it's getting late where you're at, um, a huge amount of time for anybody to put in. And you do this day in and day out. I'm so thankful to be able to do this with the CME group as well as IB. Um, and all of you that took the time to be here, you know, God, we had a ton of people here 
and a lot of people that are in off hours are going to watch this as well. Um, I appreciate all the time that you guys put in just watching and, and uh, letting me give back. Hopefully, it'll spark more questions. If I missed your questions today, all you have to do is email me either at uh, timothymorgetmarketgeometry.com or timothymorgetgmail.com. You can drop an email to Cynthia. She'll get it to me. Um, we'll always be here the second, uh, what is it? It's the second Thursday of each month, which is two weeks after the CME Group's uh, Futures School. Um, and we always cover the same instrument that they cover because we're sponsored by the CME Group. So they tell me what's next. And so, you know, you can always come next month and ask your questions, or you can drop me a line. It's fine. It's always on Thursday. Did I say Tuesday? It's always Thursday. Thursday. That's right. Thursday. Uh, we're we're doing CME <laughs> events the second and the fourth Tuesday. Or, <laughs> now you've got me. The I'm second sorry. and fourth Thursday of every month. <laughs> I, you know, Cynthia, some days I don't even know what day it is. So. Uh, <laughs> oh, and I'm, I'm like that as well. But it is Thursday, Lucky. Sorry about that. So it's the second and the fourth Thursday of each month. You can always join us live uh, for any of these events or simply by registering. You'll get a direct link to that recorded playback. So it looks like we are going to conclude today. Ah, tremendous uh Tim, thank you so much. Um, but I do want to end the session because I know there have, I've already gotten information or requests from people who can attend live who are waiting for the recorded playback. Alrighty. So Good. we'll go ahead and compile all of this information and send it out to everyone just as soon as we can. So watch your email later on this afternoon for that direct link to today's playback. And don't miss the slides as they pop up as you exit today's event. You can actually use the X in the upper right-hand corner corner of the screen. So thanks once again, Tim. Uh, wonderful presentation. Looking forward to uh, August 9th is the next one. So mark your Ooh, calendars. What are we doing? We'll what all are we doing? Uh, agricultural products. Oh, oh, great. I got some great grain stuff. Uh, I'm really excited. I've been okay. waiting for grains. So, well, excellent. Now seems to be the time of year to be talking about it. So um, we'll let Tim go and start on next month's presentation. There you go. Thanks. There you go. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank everyone for sticking with us this long. It has been a lengthy presentation, and we do appreciate the time that you're spending um, <clears throat> with us. So thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. And do keep in mind, trade smart. So thanks, all. Thanks, you, Cynthia. You take care. I'll see you in a month. Everybody okay. take care. Sounds good. Bye-bye. Bye, all.